welcome back once again to The Close Read, our regular podcast for the Claremont Review of Books. I'm Spencer Clavin, Associate Editor of the CRB. And as our regular listeners know, I have the pleasure a few times an issue of sitting down with various authors from the latest CRB and discussing the themes that they raise in their pieces uh, to greater length. Today, I'm joined, I think it's fair to say, by a special guest. Uh, longtime readers of, of CRB will be very familiar with Mark Helprin because he appears in every issue. Uh, and his Parthian shot columns are a mainstay and a beloved staple at the back of every issue. You can find him commenting, uh, not just on the issues we'll be talking about today, but on a whole range of things, depending on what's in the news. The name of his column in our most late, my most recent issue, the fall 2021 issue, is Once More with Feeling. But I'm going to chat with him also about his previous column, Two Blind Mice, because they touch on similar themes having to do with international relations and, and geopolitics, painting, um, uh, I think you'll all agree, a fairly grim picture. But first, before I dive in and start reading from these pieces, uh, Mark, welcome to the show. Thank you, Spencer. Uh, it's great to have you. I'm going to, for the audience that haven't yet gotten to your latest column, I'm going to read just a couple paragraphs from this one and, and the most recent one before we dive in. So as I mentioned, the, the most recent one's called Once More with Feeling. And the premise of it is that although history doesn't repeat itself exactly, if you zoom out far enough, at, like zooming out on a coastline, um, you'll be able to see contours that do, in fact, look troublesome, troublesomely similar arguing that a lot of what's going on in the world and in the US at the moment looks sort of uncomfortably like what happened in Europe in between the wars. And you go on to write, hopelessly beyond merely refusing to fight for king and country, we, that is we Americans, are materially obsessed, paralyzed by imagined privations and exaggerated grievances, and anesthetized by snacks, drugs, and rock and roll, i.e. addictions and entertainment. With lightning speed, what remains of the Republic is dividing into countless racial, sexual, and ethnic Bantustans, signifying nothing more than the death of equality before the law. That this seems eerily familiar is because it is what civilization has spent centuries trying to escape. Listeners and readers can go to that column for further parallels between uh, our appeasement-focused moment and the uh, years leading up to the Second World War. But then, just as a sort of chaser to that shot, I wanted to read a bit about uh, Mark's comment, a bit from Mark's comments on our leadership. Um, in the wake of the uh, June Putin-Biden summit, uh, this column appeared two blind mice. And uh, writing about the sort of limpness and ineffectiveness of, of Biden's effort to get Russia to turn, uh, you know, toward the West and, and sort of abandon China, as I understand you to be saying here, um, you, you write, Mark, it is surprising that an administration so witless as to believe that human nature can be wrenched from its roots and conscripted in service of a simple minded flowchart utopia would misread both past and present. That is, is it surprising that they would? The president's and his advisor's ability to perceive threats hyperactive domestically stops dead at the water's edge. Like Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, a study in weakness, and climate czar John Kerry, a study in pompously getting everything wrong perhaps since birth, they are oblivious of historical patterns, the balance of power, the military balance and its implications, and present dangers not involving atmospheric temperature variations. Apparently, they simply cannot see that Russia has already gotten most of what it wants from Europe, envisions little obstruction to getting more, and has a realistic view of precipitously declining American power upon which it acts and will act in the future. So, Mark, as I said, that's a that's a fairly grim picture. It's also, I think, a very realistic picture, a sober uh, attempt to evaluate what's going on um, in, in American leadership and as American leadership presents itself to the world stage. My first question for you is about determinism. I mean, uh, when you when you start talking about history repeat itself, uh, the, the word that comes into mind is doomed. Are we doomed? That is to, you know, rocket toward a catastrophe. Do you see any hope for uh, an about face? And if so, where? No. Uh, I I don't. Um, you know, I'll tell you something that, that, of course, the viewers and listeners of and to this uh, podcast uh, will be familiar with Charles Kessler, who is the editor of the, the Claremont Review of Books. And I think it was in 2008 
when right before the election, we were speaking and I said to him, well, do you think who's going to win? Because at that point, uh, most conservatives and Republicans obviously were hoping that Cain would win. And uh, Charles said to me, well, how do you want me to answer? Would you like me to answer in terms of what I want, what I hope? What, what I, what I try to expect or what I think objectively as a, as a historian and an analyst. And I said, well, I think I know what you hope, but step into your role as a, as a historian and an analyst. And he said, Obama, hmm. that, you know, uh, so you have to be, if one gets, if one is truly professional as he is and much more than that, what you have to do is override your own inclinations and override your own hopes and and be as uh, ruthless and rigorous as you possibly can be. And that's why my answer is no, I don't think so. I think that the the uh, essentially the sinews of of America, which I always believed were still there and and that we could recoup and we could recover, I think that they're largely gone now because of the upcoming generations which have been educated into all the things that you that you mentioned. In other words, dependence and uh, the expectation that they're owed uh, everything and, and, and a strange affection for the enemies of the United States. As if, as if they're really, for instance, if you speak to people on the left and you say the enemies of the United States, they, they have a, an immediate reaction. What? what, what? What enemies, hmm. which, is, which is twin, is there, there, there's reaction that, oh, well, of course we have enemies because we deserve them. But the combination of these two things, uh, it, I mean, look at the government. The government, as it is now constituted, is ideologically in that, in that camp and deeply so. We have, we have educated ourselves into thinking that we are the, obviously, as most people who would be reading the CRB would believe that, that we are the uh, the source of all the world's uh, troubles and that we deserve essentially to go down, you know, that our moment is over and we can't recoup it. Now, Republicans uh, and conservatives think that the man on the white horse can come and do it because right. it has been done. It has been done. The Churchill did it. Lincoln did it. Uh, to, to some extent, Reagan did it, although it was sort of cut short, you know, because uh, it wasn't, wasn't carried forward. That has possibility in history, but you have to look at the, the basic material from which you would help the return. And I think that basic material is not is not sufficiently sculptable in in, in that sense. So no, I, I don't I don't think so. I think that let's say that uh, in in uh, 2022 and 2024. Republicans take back the Senate, the House, and then, and then the presidency. Well, uh, we've, we've done that a number of times. It hasn't been sufficient because the, the larger movement, the tectonic movement, overcomes whatever anyone can do. Now, there are things that can be done, that's for sure, hmm. but they'd be very difficult. And there's some that are less difficult that are that would have great effect and that might, you know, pause things and also set back our our enemies and strengthen our position. Would you like to know uh, some? <laughs> I would actually. I'd like to yeah. ask you about a few of them in turn. You've mentioned precisely the names that would, I think, come up in most people's minds in their hope for a sort of cometh the hour, cometh the man uh, yeah. reversal. But barring that, right, there are, uh, I think, a few obvious threats or a few sort of looming uh, situations that most people are thinking about. And I'd like to hear your opinion about, you know, e which of them is uh, particularly significant, starting, I guess, with Taiwan. I mean, is, uh, we all we look to China. I think the right is, is very keen on talking about China at the moment. You seem more keen actually on talking about Russia, unless maybe that's just the no, burden no, of the no, pieces no. of Britain. No, OK. No, that's not so. Look, here, let me go. Let me just tell you what I think about that. Yeah. In uh, in the 90s, I began to look at China through the lens through a lens that I had learned in graduate school from my beloved advisor, who is now dead, and uh, who taught me 
one many things, but this one particular thing was a, a a lens through which you could look at what is happening with a country like China vis-a-vis -vis the United States, what what uh, is called often the liquidities tap the trap. In other words, a rising country and and the dominant power. And I I used that to do the following. I figured out. I then presented in an article in National Review in the year 2000, early, it was January, so I wrote it in 99. It was called East Wind. And what I did was look back to see the effect of China's uh, enormous rates of growth on its prospects in the future, vis-a-vis -vis not only the economy, but also its military capacity. And in the year 2000, I said, by Sometime between 2015 and 2020, based mm -hmm. on my calculations of this, which I'll go into in a second, bore you to death. <laughs> China will reach close to military parity with the United States, and in the in the eastern in the Western Pacific, parity, of course, even superiority. And at the time, everyone laughed at me. I mean, they said, "Are you mm -hmm. kidding? What are you talking about? It's, it's impossible." Well. Here's, here's, here's what I saw, and, I, and I'll update it. In 1990, the G GNP of China was $360 billion. In 2020, it's $15 trillion. Right. That's, a, that's a multiple of 42 times. Yeah. It, per capita, it was $320 per person in China. Now it's 11000 That's a multiple of 34, 000, or 34 times because... It got another 300 million people in that in that period. So then it's the same multiple as GNP. Their defense expenditure, and he, and here's here's the key: if you're 34 times better off than you were in living memory, then you could slice a bit. Or actually, it's the government which does all the deciding, but a bit of that could be sliced off. Let's say that you're that you're only. Uh, but you would have been 40 times better off, but now you're 34 times. Or if you're 34 times, you're 25 times. You're not going to care. 25 times better off. What is that? What is the, the uh, margin? Where does it go? It can go into defense spending. Hence, in 1990, the Chinese defense budget, now these things are very hard to figure out because they're, um, there's purchasing power parity. There's a question of the or not conscription. There's all kinds of factors that, that make it imprecise. But roughly, according to the military balance of the National Institute of Strategic Studies in London, the, and these, those are the figures I used, Chinese military budget was $6 billion. Mm. Uh, you know, that's uh, in Washington, that's long. Yeah. But now, uh, it's in 2020, it's $250 billion. That's a that's a multiple of forty two. So what you see then is the, the and, and they have just begun to really expand. Now, when I say really expand, I'm talking about a surge, not the kind of surge in Afghanistan, but a surge in production, a surge in deployment, a surge in their military capacity. Sure. Uh, yeah. Now, let me just say that that surge is an example, just an example of how it works. We at, way back then in, in 1990, uh, they had eight ICBMs. Well, now they have 104, but they they're building new fields, and within two years they'll have more than we have. They have road mobile missiles. We don't. Uh, it's very important for avoiding a, a, a first strike. They also have rail mobile missiles and all kinds of things that that we don't. We have been pushed back into a, in many ways, now already a secondary position. And one more thing before you say anything else, if I may. Please. Um, yeah. In terms of the surge of, of, of uh, and, and by the way, they've held back uh, until this time. They could have done much, much more, but they were they're very patient and they were waiting for their technologies to mature before they actually built things and deployed them and went in, into numbers. And a great example of that is the is is the Navy. They have the largest navy in the world now, and uh, you know we we had uh, under Reagan seven hundred principal combatants, principal surface combatants, and, and and submarines. 
they had virtually nothing. They had uh, in 1990, they had uh, 56. Now they have their navy is 350 some odd ships. Ours is 283. But that's nothing because they can surge production. They have they now know that what they want to build it and 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 have the technology to do it. And they can surge production because I'll, I'll ask you a question. We have six shipyards in the United States that can build big stuff. Mm-hmm. How many does China have? Oh, I, I do not know the answer to that, but I'm going to guess it's multiples. More than 100. Wow. See, So they yeah. can do what Henry Kaiser did in World War II. They yeah. can surge production and so that they will be really dominant in what? In the Pacific. See, that's what's between us and China. And think think for a second. We we rely, and I mentioned this, I think, in the second piece that you're um, Americans foolishly believe that, and, and you can see why, that the oceans protect us. Because after all, thousands of miles of water, you can't walk on it. Uh, so so we, we say, therefore, that's why we're blind to what's going on in the world. We think we really can't be touched as long as there's a Starbucks around the corner. Everything is fine. You know, so. Uh, yeah. But but in fact, if you look in history, um, during the American Revolution, though, way back then, the ocean didn't protect us. And they had just wooden ship that took months to get across. And they had very, very little uh, load bearing capacity. They would carry, but, but the British almost overwhelmed us. It was supposed to run. In the War of 1812, the same thing. In the First World War, the, uh, the Zimmerman telegram suggested the possibility of Germany putting an army in Mexico, a land army. In the Second World War, my father was in intelligence, and he was assigned to go to Mexico, uh, to a town called Guaymas, uh, where he and, and, and another guy who was also doing the same thing, observed their job was to observe the Japanese fishing fleet, which was much like China's um, military, marine militia. Uh, hmm. they, they, were, they were Japanese naval officers surveying the Mexican coast because they were thinking of an invasion. So we have to control the Pacific. If we're going to survive the, if, if there won't be Chinese domination of the world. And to do that, we need the Navy and the Air Force. We we have been neglecting. Let, let me just give you one example. Hmm. Uh, the naval shipbuilding budget this year is twenty-seven billion dollars. An aircraft carrier costs twelve billion. You know, a, a destroyer, a Zumwalt type destroyer, an advanced destroyer, is a billion or so. Uh, submarines, a couple of billion. That's twenty-seven billion is nothing. Hmm. And when you consider that we bailed out, what was it? Uh, the the uh, I forgot the name of the, the uh, Wall Street firm that uh, Lehman Brothers. Right. And that was 13 years ago. Uh, we bailed them out with $150 billion. So 13 years later, we're yep. spending $20, $21, only $27 billion to keep the Navy, which will protect us from China and the Pacific uh, in, in ships. How can you think that we would that we would survive with that kind of policy? Okay, so so let me ask you about the Thucydides trap. I, I imagine that a lot of our listeners will be familiar with what Thucydides says in the opening of his histories, but just as a primer for those who aren't, right? I mean, Thucydides' account essentially of the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War is that whatever else, whatever pretextual causes were advanced, the real reason why these two conglomerates why these two confederacies went to war was because they they got nervous about each other's power. The, the, a rising Athens sparked the ambition of Sparta, um, and there simply couldn't be two dominant powers in, in the Mediterranean. Uh, one of the interesting things about the account you're giving of China is that and America is that it's kind of a one-sided Thucydides trap. I mean, you're describing one incredibly ambitious power um, yep. making moves to advance its hold and its strategic position, and another that is f- flailing sort of ineptly under a, you know a succession of bad leaders and and not really either recognizing the threat or showing any ambition to deal with it. I mean, do you think that that fundamentally changes the dynamic um, with vis-a-vis, you know, the Peloponnesian War? We're in kind of a different situation here, I would think. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, um, by the way, it occurs to me vis-a-vis the uh, Thucydides trap that uh, if you go to Greece now 
Athens, of course, is a big, thriving city. Mm -hmm. And Sparta is like, a, you know, a tiny Disneyland, just <laughs> the ruins. Uh -huh. So it's, uh, some some uh, cities, some states, state entities can triumph and the others can just disappear. I don't think we're going to disappear soon, but maybe we will. But as, as to your question, uh, uh, we know how to surrender really, really well. Uh, of late, I mean, look at our dealings with Iran. I have never seen anything in, I don't think just any much in history, maybe Chamberlain, but even Chamberlain came around yeah, uh, yeah. and realized that he was wrong. Uh, the, the way we act in, in, in with Iran, for example, is just begging to be stepped on. It's, it's masochistic <laughs> uh, and, and yeah. also fatal, too. Yeah. I have one final question for you, actually, in the time that remains. And I think it's one that's been on a lot of people's minds, especially since the disasters in Afghanistan, um, mm -hmm. especially people who served at some point during those 20 years. Um, there was a lot of grief and sorrow over the concept that this might have been service in vain, that deaths might have been in vain, um, and that because of the ineptitude of the leadership, good and noble people signed up for patriotic reasons to do th something that so catastrophically blew up in our face. Um, you've seen military service and obviously thought deeply about the situation on the ground and abroad. Uh, what in your view is the duty of a patriotic American? I mean, there are still some people out there who love their country and want to do right by it. And if it's the case, as you say, that some form of conflict is inevitable or, or brewing in the future, um, what would you say to a, like a young 18, 20 something guy trying to figure out how to how to do right by his country under bad leadership? Oh, uh, I'm I'm a, a very uh, disqualified person in that respect, in that uh, during Vietnam, uh, I avoided the draft. And I, ah, by the way, okay. I gave I gave a uh, speech at the Corps of Cadets at West Point when I was old, yep. um, actually apologizing for that. Mm. I had concluded in the intervening years that I was not the legislature. Uh, they owed a duty to my country, which was decided democratically by, by all. And mm. if I had been a uh, conscientious objector, that would be one thing. But, but I, I'm not a pacifist. In fact, plenty of military service after that and uh uh so, so in general what i what i would have to say is if your country calls you answer but of course we have a volunteer army so it's a it's a question of the, the will of the person what is he going to do if one goes by it, you know, the current leadership and what's been happening in the military how is has been uh, politicized and defanged and uh made into a social experimental body, then uh, I would be hesitant to join. But And I think that anyone who would, would be really doing a great thing because they, they would, in, in some senses, be operating contrary to their own personal interest. But mm. for the interest of the country, because leadership changes and the threat is out there and we must have a strong military. I'm not the one to advise anyone to join because, I, because of my history. Although I could have helped him join later as I did, but <laughs> but it's a it's it's it was very disheartening to say the least uh, what happened in Afghanistan. We could at least have kept uh, Bagram, and at the very minimum, we could have gotten everybody out who helped us instead of abandoning them to death and destruction. But uh, but no, overall, my answer has got to be. Um, it would take a bit of heroism and selflessness, but the United States, our our children, our descendants, and the country itself, which is a very beautiful thing based on a, on a most beautiful uh, concepts, has got to be preserved for the sake of us, for the sake of the world, even. So yes, I would say you know, do the heroic thing if if, you, if that's your um, if you think that that could be your metier. And if you want to serve, that would be a very good thing to do. Yeah. 
Yeah, you're uh, describing, at, you know, in Afghanistan, a, another example of the kind of ineptitude you described in terms of Russia in, in your column. I mean, I think there was, as you say, it, it's it, you could have different opinions about whether we should have gotten out, but the way in which we did and the, the haste and the wasteful haste with which we did, I think, is um, – is in some sense the, the travesty of it. Um, I'm speaking with Mark Helpern. He's our regular columnist in the back of the Claremont Review of Books. He's also a novelist. Uh, his novels include Winter's Tale, A Soldier of the Great War, and Freder Freddy and Frederica. He's he's a storied uh, writer with a, a lot of credits to his name, so I'm not going to list them all here, but I am going to direct you to markhelpern.org if you want to learn more about him and his work. And once more, the two columns that we've been discussing are Once More with Feeling and Two Blind Mice, but obviously there's plenty of others where that came from. Um, the latest is in the CRB for fall 2021, now live on ClaremontReviewOfBooks.com or uh, winging its way to your mailbox if it hasn't gotten there already. If you don't have one in your mailbox, then you ought to subscribe because uh, you get Mark's writing and lots of other excellent stuff as well. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure. You're very welcome. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Close Read, a Claremont Review of Books podcast and a production of the Claremont Institute. Our publisher is Ryan Williams. Our producer is Jake Gannon, and I'm your host, Spencer Clavin. Thanks to Benjamin Squirit for our music. If you liked this episode and you'd like to hear more in-depth interviews based on the Claremont Review of Books, please do subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. We're available on all major platforms. And if you'd like to support us, we encourage you to leave a five-star review on iTunes. Thanks again for listening, and we will see you again next time.